That's that we're ready to start. Brilliant. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining us um, this afternoon or this morning for um, for Paulo in in uh, Boston. You're in uh, Boston, uh, Massachusetts, at the moment. And um, yes, indeed. Brilliant. So, Professor uh, Paul Jankowski is the Ray Ginger Professor of History at Brandeis University. Um, he grew up in Geneva, New York, and Paris, and attended international schools before taking an undergraduate and postgraduate uh, uh, graduate degrees at uh, Balliol College, uh, Oxford. Um, he published has published widely uh, books, including uh, very recently Verdun, Verdun: The Longest Battle of the Great War, uh, and of course the the topic of tonight's discussion, All Against All, uh, the Long Winter of 1933 and the Origins of the Second uh, World War. We're delighted to be joined by you to have that discussion. Uh, and Paul, I think the, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thanks very much. Um, thank you for that um, uh, that, in, uh, that uh, introduction. I just want to, let's see, uh, move to a different view if I, um, let's see, I want to uh, just do, I need to somehow minimize this for a minute. Um, let's see if I can call up my that's not it. I need to call up a couple of notes here. How do I, <clears throat> do I put myself on full screen? Uh, do I? Uh, are, you, are you bringing up um, Word, Word documents, or are you? Yeah, I just I think I need to um, go into gallery view, don't I? Uh, no, that's not it. Um, I just need, there we are. So if um, is that all right? Yeah, that's perfect. You you can you can share your screen at any point. So um... yeah, it's fine. So I'll I'll leave myself like that as a. Uh, uh, um, uh, in, in one of these cells. And exactly. I, and so now you can still see me. We can still see you. Um, yeah, right. Good. Well, uh, that's fine then. I just wanted to um, get that straight. But uh, look, uh, thanks again I, um, uh, for, uh, for this invitation and for that uh, nice introduction. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, many, uh, many moons ago, I, um, I took part in uh, the Stubb Society at, uh, at Oxford. I, I assume it's still there. Um, and I, um, I don't think then that speakers who gave very lo long and uh, dense, uh, highly specialized academic lectures were very popular. And I don't think they'd be very popular uh, now in view of the, um, uh, view of the, uh, uh, the medium. Uh, so I, um, uh, let, me, um, let me talk loosely uh, for uh, 25 minutes or so about some of the, um, uh, the themes uh, of, my, um, of my recent book uh, and see if anyone wants to pick up on them uh, afterwards. Now, uh, I'm sure that uh, most of you uh, have encountered the um, many parallels being drawn, especially in the press, uh, between what's happening now in the 1930s uh, most common, I think, with the parallels about authoritarianism, populism, nationalism, um, even fascism. Um, but, um, and those parallels can always be shaky. Historians are usually very, um, very reluctant to draw them. Uh, but still, they're fun. And there is one among them, and I think it's the most valid, is also the one that's least mentioned. Uh, I mean the way in which uh, transnational protest movements today, this year really, um, uh, are proceeding in tandem with uh, national fragmentation. Uh, uh, last spring and summer, even as the uh, worldwide protest movements against racial inequality, racial violence and injustice uh, spread, um, they, uh, nations continue to ignore uh, or a pull out of multilateral agreements. Uh, they continue to raise tariffs, threaten neighbors, close borders to keep out COVID-19 uh, and so on. Um, uh, it's as though nations continued pulling uh, into themselves, even as supranational causes uh, continue to flourish. Uh, this tension, I think, is, a, there is a parallel there with the 30s. Uh, these kinds of transnational causes and enthusiasms abounded in the early 30s, which is the period my, my, my book um, looks at. Uh, pacifism was a big one. Um, uh, the disarmament conference that opened at Geneva in February 1932 uh, attracted petitions and delegations in its opening day from organizations that were said to represent 200 million people uh, around the world. Uh, world government was another, usually centering on the League of Nations, 
communism, revolutionary communism was, was yet another, even though it might have been poorly understood, um, seen as a capitalist system blamed for the uh, global depression. And uh, in, in, in New York, uh, uh, communist intellectuals left each other saying, meet me on the barricades. And um, uh, the great light in the East brought pilgrims from far and wide. Um, so they were there, these transnational enthusiasms, but they in, were no match for their rivals. Uh, the call of national primacy was uh, sounding everywhere. Uh, expansionist here, uh, isolationist there, uh, sometimes derided as uh, beggar thy neighbor or uh, every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost. But uh, whatever form heard by growing multitudes of followers, uh, I mean that uh, before we even got to the crises of the late 1930s, but before we even got to uh, appeasement proper, uh, a, a new variety of nationalism was taking hold. Uh, most nationalisms uh, focus on a hereditary enemy or a single oppressor. Um, this one was directed at a hostile world. Uh, the entire world was seen as the, as the, uh, as the potential adversary in some way. Uh, and it was that kind of uh, sentiment that was driving uh, countries away from uh, uh, international commitments and away from each other. So I think that kind of tension happened uh, durably uh, the, uh, around 1932 to 33. And um, in, my, uh, in my book, I uh, try to, um, to show how, at least to narrate it and describe it. Uh, look, for example, at the um, national tantrum set off by the somewhat uh, arcane matter of the gold standard. Uh, when countries started leaving it in the early 1930s, they set off storms of national recriminations uh, Ramsay MacDonald uh, blamed foreign speculators and foreign bankers for forcing Britain off gold. Uh, and uh, many of the uh, mainstream newspapers, not all, but many in Britain uh, said the same and celebrated the country's release from international fetters and uh, the kind of cosmopolitan metal, cosmopolitan currency without a home. Uh, and uh, variously looked forward to a kind of splendid isolation within the spacious confines of the British Empire and the Dominions. That was no insular affectation. Uh, in this particular matter, the gold standard seems technical and dispassionate, hardly the stuff of uh, heated political uh, sentiment, but it did uh, excite outbursts uh, of a um, uh, uh, of an uh, us against the world sort everywhere. In uh, April 1933, the newly elected American president, newly inaugurated actually, um, Franklin Roosevelt, um, did exactly what the British had done 18 months before, and he took the dollar off gold and effectively devalued it. Uh, in uh, late June, early July, uh, he refused pleas at the World Economic Conference in London uh, to help stabilize the uh, emerging world monetary chaos. Now, I bring it up here because at home, some of the uh, liberal Eastern uh, papers did uh, criticize the president's intemperate actions. Uh, paper, the New York Herald Tribune called it economic jingoism, which in a way it was. But much more typical was the reaction of the mass circulation tabloids in the family papers, as well as some of the other big city dailies. The um, Hearst Press, which is a mass circulation, uh, isolationist press really, uh, hailed the dawn of what it called a, um, a new Americanism. Uh, let, me, um, let me just call up a couple of, um, of cartoons here. Uh, I want to go to screen sharing, if I may. Absolutely. And um, so here is, um, uh, let's see. Now, can, can you see that? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, so that, um, that I think is from the New York, I think that's from the New York Post. I had, it doesn't, um, uh, but that shows the Roosevelt statement landing on the World Conference table at the Geological Museum in London, where it was being held. Uh, and um, rather gleefully, the, the, the artist here, uh, 
is uh, showing there are various hopes for a currency stabilization scheme and a tariff scheme and so on falling by the falling by the roadside falling by the uh, falling onto the floor as they look in shocked um, uh, indignation this one more clearly this is from one of the Hearst papers it's I think the New York American from uh, July 1933 um, now that uh, Roosevelt's famous bombshell telegram arrived on the 4th of July, National Independence Day. So pest swatting time. Uh, the, uh, this is as clear a statement of isolationist sentiment as any I can um, find in, in, this, in this form. Uh, Europe, um, domestic affairs, uh, the U.S. business and the, the various pests are list, listed here. They're of all kinds, which, some of which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, disarmament, currency stabilization, and so on. Um, and uh, this um, uh, this is the kind of um, sentiment I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, it went farther than that um, when you um, uh, 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 some of them actually welcomed the advent of a what um, one of them called a prickly Americanism. So this is. This went on. I mean, across across the Atlantic, countries that were still on gold and therefore at a disadvantage were furious. Now, what I'm getting at here is if that's what something as bloodless and technical as exchange rates and the gold standards could set off among former allies, would-be friends, the French, the British, the Americans, the victors of 1918, uh, then imagine what uh, debts and tariffs could do uh, to everyone. Uh, the French and the British and uh, some others owed large debts to the to the Americans from the war. As, as, as you know, the Germans owed reparations to the French, the Belgians, and the British. And of course, these had poisoned the air in the 1920s. Now, they still did so in the early 30s. They could have been resolved among experts, these debts, if mass national sentiments had not hijacked them. It was politically impossible because emotions were running so high about this for uh, pragmatic, well-intentioned experts to get together and resolve the matter. Let me go back to um, uh, screen sharing again. Um, and uh, uh, this, is, uh, th uh, this is an American, I wish I could somehow enlarge, the, there we are. Um, now this is a, an American view of the French refusal to pay um, and um, Uncle Sam presenting his, his bill for a, a supposed uh, feast uh, uh, that this uh, snooty and decadent Frenchman uh, has been enjoying. Uh, that's an American view. This is a French view. Uh, that, uh, I don't know if you can see the title, La Victoire, uh, that for Americans, the victory of 1918 was only about money. Uh, the American, uh, 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 with a uh, take off on American popular culture. And this is a British view. This is from Punch, uh, December 1932. And we have, um, I take it to be uh, John Bull telling Uncle Sam as they are on a cliff, and it reads world crisis here. Uh, my dear fellow, I ask you, is, is this the moment to ask me to hand over that debt? So um, let me uh, leave this now, and I'll, I'll go back, to, um, go back to, to, that's where I was for a minute. Um, the, um, I don't need to tell you, that was debts. I don't need to tell you how emotive an issue reparations was on both sides of the Rhine, both among the Germans who described them as uh, plunder, or as a tribute, they more often called them, um, and the uh, French who saw them as indemnity for the destruction visited upon them um, and their industry during the, during the war. My point in all of this is different. It's that at bottom, none of this was about money. Uh, it was about the insult to national sovereignty uh, the reparations were effectively ended uh, for good at Lausanne in 1932. After having been reduced and then delayed and then stretched out, they were effectively abolished. 
Uh, but that really made very little difference to most of the German press or most of the German parties. Uh, the uh, grievances ling uh, the, the grievances survived, uh, even festered. Uh, and um, something else, whether in the recrimination over currencies or war debts or reparations, or any of the other somber after effects of the Great War uh, was going on. Uh, and uh, I think what's happening here is the, uh, the nationalization of resentment. Uh, it, it consists of identifying your own personal unhappiness or your own personal misfortune with that of the nation. Um, for all who lived through, uh, through the, the Great War or the Depression, these were um, disasters. These were events that happened to them. Um, they were um, they were its victims. They were they were not its villains. L let me um, let me quickly share the screen again. Uh, there, there are two covers from the um, German um, satirical center left satirical uh, Simplicissimus from uh, from this time. Um, the um, the, um, this one is a bit earlier. This is from late 1931, uh, autumn of 1931, no matter. And it shows um, a recumbent and invalided Germany, uh, sick from its political divisions, whether, uh, let's see, communist, Nazi, or nationalist right. Those are the colors of the Wilhelmine Empire. Uh, being attended by the world's physicians um, the, the, uh, that's Hoover, uh, the American president. There's Ramsey MacDonald, Pierre Laval, Aristide Briand, the French foreign minister. That's uh, Henderson, Walter Henderson, the British foreign secretary at the time, though not for much longer in the summer of 1931. Um, and that's Stimson, the American secretary of state. And the, um, the caption reads after um, long, it's the, uh, these are speaking, these, these rather smug looking doctors, rather satisfied happy at the outcome. After um, extensive investigation, we, are, we have reached the conclusion, uh, your condition is so serious that you can only help yourself. Uh, this, um, a kind of national self-pity, which you can see in this, this cover as well. Now, this is from a year later. It's from uh, 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 October 1932, I think I can't see the date here because of the, I can't remember it. Uh, and here, uh, so the, the, uh, the, uh, the population, the people of this German uh, city on this German street are uh, awaiting some new cosmic catastrophe. Uh, is this now a, a new, is this now a new dawn or a new, um, uh, 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 a new cataclysm, a new um, uh, a new conflagration. Uh, the, 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 uh, that sense of a uh, uh, of a disaster visited upon them, like the war, like the depression, um, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and so on. Uh, this um, uh, in, in in all countries uh, touched by the economic catastrophe, uh, leaders try to encourage that sentiment. Uh, that the insult to the well-being of the citizen uh, was the uh, insult um, uh, uh, was the insult to the nation, um, and blaming the world in a way was irresistible. So he, here is another political cartoon. This is from the um, this is from the French right-wing uh, weekly Candide. Um, uh, sorry, uh, um, there we are, and I um, don't know why it, and uh, here is the, um, the, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is, Con this is Marianne, <clears throat> uh, the, um, here is Marianne, the emblematic figure of the, um, the, the icon of the, the emblem of the French Republic, uh, beneath the torrents of misfortunes coming from, again, the outside world, there is obviously the Nazi thunderbolt uh, threatening, Hitler, revenge for 
Versailles, but really for the defeat, uh, war debts, treaty revision, um, disarmament, um, the elect 12, that's a reference to a, um, a plan that Mussolini had for a four power directory. Um, but it's the same idea here, the passive recipient of misfortunes, uh, the, uh, which, the, uh, which I was uh, trying to uh, also show a minute ago, um, the, uh, that blaming the world uh, is something that you can find quite commonly. Uh, Hoover, president um, until the November election, well, until March of 1933, um, uh, uh, talked to blaming the world. He did not, in fact, react that way uh, after the 1929 stock crash. There he blamed American excesses and various problems. But when it spread, and when he found he couldn't do anything about it, he took to blaming a, uh, the world for, um, for, for the, the country's misfortunes. That same sentiment could induce others, especially um, dictators and demagogues, to uh, inspire their listeners with thoughts of defying the world more aggressively. Um, so I stick with the, uh, the uh, autumn of 1932. Uh, you can find that kind of thinking gaining currency in some military and political circles in Japan and in the Japanese press, which was actually quite rich and quite, um, quite varied. Um, and uh, newspapers that might, um, uh, that might doubt the, um, well, let me back up for a minute. Uh, the uh, um, the uh, notion that Japan had nothing more to gain from commitments to the, um, uh, from, from international commitments, whether in Geneva or anywhere else, a, uh, a, a practice that had distinguished Japanese policy in the 1920s. Uh, the notion that Japan had nothing more to gain from uh, such, um, such adventures was, was gaining ground. And now, uh, a, year after the, uh, <laughs> a year after the invasion of Manchuria, uh, newspapers that uh, had uh, doubted the wisdom of that adventure uh, stiffened uh, in the face of international criticism. And in uh, November, one of them bitterly asked, and this was not a particularly militaristic right-wing journal, but it uh, asked why Britain had all its imperial outlets and Japan had none. Uh, the, um, another instance of this um, previous June, the Italian foreign minister, uh, Dino Grandi, had uh, asked the Italian Senate uh, how 42 million Italians could possibly live and prosper in a country half the size of Germany or of France or of Spain, as he put it, uh, without riches or raw materials, uh, imprisoned in a sea that others controlled, and by others, you know, the British and the French in particular, uh, but see that others controlled um, and that lay between them, the Italians, and their markets in Africa. Um, uh, suggestion that their commerce is being strangled. Uh, the, the obverse of this was a kind of attitude of defiance and arrogance, not just to some one particular nation, although the Italians were particularly uh, exercised by some in particular, but to everyone. Uh, I'll just show up an Italian uh, Italian cartoon. I want to um, go back to see if I can uh, find it. Um, so this is um, here we are. Um, if I can now here is a uh, a confident uh, black shirted fascist. Uh, basically uh, defying everyone, whether it's the, uh, the figure of Uncle Sam, the American, the protectionist, uh, can't seem to, there we are. Uh, this is meant to be Yugoslavia, SHA, that's the kingdom of the South Slavs, the uh, uh, Slovi, uh, Serbs, Croatians, and Slovenes, the braying Yugoslav donkey, which the Italians regarded actually as a sphere of influence for them. This is the foreign anti-fascist press. Um, and uh, these, this is the lying French serpent. Uh, 
and uh, so on. You you can see the, uh, the the affirmation of Italy against the world, and the slogan here is "Mene frego," which really means uh, "I don't give a damn." Uh, the um, I I think the the uh, the sentiment there is uh, quite clear, and um, I. Uh, would add that the most shining example of this kind of us versus them uh, is, of course, the Soviet Union, uh, because it was inscribed into its foundational ideology, uh, the homeland of socialism encircled by the hostile uh, capitalist world. Uh, but uh, Stalin had added a uh, distinctly nationalist Philip to that. Uh, in 1931 and again in um, 1933, he justified his first and then his second five-year plan, this is the transition from one to the other. Um, these are the plans that brought, especially the first one, crash industrialization and mass suffering. He justified them on the grounds that uh, Russia had always been backward, uh, that it had always been invaded by others taking advantage of its backwardness by Mongols and Swedes and Poles and Germans and many others. Uh, and that's, they would do so again if the country did not materialize, if the country did not industrialize. This was also a way of national self-promotion, of claiming that Russia, now as the USSR, was finally catching and overtaking the West. And I actually think this was the moment that Soviet nationalism was born. Um, and uh, like the Italian, it could uh, uh, express itself uh, as a... Um, uh, almost as a certain kind of um, certain kind of arro uh, almost arrogance. Uh, here is a cartoon from the uh, these Soviet weekly um, crocodile. Um, let's see, there they are. And it uh, this one uh, refers to the the uh, London uh, World Economic Conference that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And uh, it shows um, the Soviet foreign minister, Litvinov, standing with a dossier uh, in front of him, a uh, large one saying the five-year plan has been fulfilled, rather triumphantly. Um, and um, around him are the delegates of the capitalist world, each of whom has a dossier in front of them reading crisis, meaning um, capitalist cri economic depression, capitalist crisis. Uh, and then there are various other uh, uh, messages, but that that is um, that itself, I think, is uh, uh, is, um, uh, is 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 clear enough. Um, and um, the um, all of these were uh, appeals to domestic sentiment, uh, and they worked. Um, the, the, everywhere, the most vocal champions of the nation uh, coupled the domestic with a the foreign threat. They're on a continuum, really. Um, they associated one with the other, and they promised uh, salvation from both. Um, and th this kind of identification surfaced in the most varied of uh, regimes and milieus, in popular, in, um, popular fears and in uh, political power struggles. In the Soviet Union, a counter-revolutionary often became a foreign agent as well as a class enemy. These all blended into one another. Uh, an enemy uh, in uh, Stalin's nascent regime of the uh, Soviet people. Um, here is one more, um, one more uh, Soviet uh, uh, cartoon, again from, uh, from Crocodile. Um, um, it should, uh... Now this shows um, at the top, uh, our, our reserves uh, in the West, and it shows masses of communist German uh, workers in the um, in the, uh, the, the, rock front, the, the, the red front, with their banner reading, long live the USSR. And at, sorry, at the bottom of the page, their reserves among us, meaning the reserves of the Western capitalists in the Soviet Union, and uh, those are 
opportunists, saboteurs, kulaks, former persons, former persons meaning Tsarist sympathizers. Uh, so in short, n n none of those actually has a foreign label attached to them. But the idea is that these agents at home are the, are, are the these enemies at home are the agents of enemies abroad. Um, and that was, uh, that was something that was quite common. And, um, and I think I'm perhaps being rather, I'm stretching it in comparing these, uh, but uh, one last one, and there are others, uh, in the United States, um, the um, internationalism of the Northeastern intellectual and foreign policy elites and of the Wall Street bankers and so on, were, um, that was very, very suspect to uh, mass papers. Then the mass, uh, I mentioned the isolationist Hearst Press a, minute, a few minutes ago. Well, it uh, regarded them, the Wall Street bankers, for example, as, as having inveigled the country into the First World War with the help of bankers in the city of London. And it regarded the others as uh, plotting to um, bring the United States uh, into the League of Nations. So I'm really talking about the detestation of cosmopolitanism in any form, which I, I find so widespread uh, and, um, in these years. Um, finally then, um, go back to what I'd mentioned at the beginning, what of all the pacifists, um, to mention one of these great internationalist um, ideals and causes. Uh, the, the movement was very important in Britain. The League of Nations Union, well, associated with pacifism at any rate, and it's an extremely vague term, um, had 400,000 members uh, around the time I'm speaking of. Uh, they were also important, numerous in um, the US, in France, in Scandinavia, some other countries. Um, as a matter of fact, those movements were really at their peak uh, at this point, um, even though they had origins that went back to before the First World War. Um, now, I suggest that the inward turn I've been talking about marks the beginning of their slow eclipse and later in the 1930s of their marginalization and that's another, that's a long story, of course. And so is the notion that this marks the beginning of the descent to war for many reasons. But the one I'd, I would end with, with, with here is um, that it, it did allow a um, frightening ignorance about potential adversaries. Um, if, um, if I could end with a, with a word about the US, um, the, the world beyond the shores, beyond its shores, uh, mattered as little in the American elections of 1932 and 1936 uh, as it has in the elections of 2020. Uh, I have actually never seen um, American media as parochial uh, as they are today. Uh, then as now, uh, the world has practically vanished from uh, public, uh, from public from discussions of public policy. Uh, I hope someone cares enough to bring it back, um, but um, that's that's another story. Uh, let me let me stop there now, as I have um, I've gone on for too long, no, uh, longer sure. than I had intended to. But let me stop and um, see if um, hand it back to uh, to you, um, uh, 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 Sebastian. Thank you very much for that, uh, Paul, and thank you very much. I think we've been using uh, primary sources uh, as means of Zoom, so that's fantastic to be able to actually see you know uh, copies of the press at the time to make sense of. Um, of, of those sentiments in the, in, in over that long winter. And, and I think, as you mentioned in the book, you talk about this idea of the, the, it flipping the script between post-war uh, to pre-war, but that it was not necessarily the case that it would necessarily lead uh, to what, what became the second uh, world war. Um, yeah. And obviously that laid with political actors and the failures of political actors. And on that theme, I would like to just um, talk uh, and hopefully bring you on this question of the failure of American leadership um, post 1929, as you say, it becomes far more insular. We see that with the um, smooth Hawley tariff uh, under Hoover. And then obviously, again, we see this distinction, this kind of dichotomy between the early Franklin Roosevelt and the later Franklin Roosevelt relating to kind of uh, American, American uh, presence uh, globally. Um, yeah. 
how do we explain that? And obviously looking beyond that to the end of the 1930s with things like the Evian Conference, where you know Franklin Roosevelt wasn't really seen to be on the question of Jewish refugees, particularly at the time of the American quota of Jewish refugees, wasn't wasn't seen to be really, you know, embodying the, the role that it had become, that global hegemon, that hegemon. Um, how can we explain the failure of American leadership? Uh, well, the, um, uh, I think the, um, well, let's say, let's, let, just to confirm what you've been saying, uh, Roosevelt came very, very late to the realization um, that uh, if the U.S. Uh, uh, that the U.S. could no longer stay out of things. It was really very late in the 30s. Um, he um, he had spoken about the dangers, but never done anything. And what he himself believed is always very difficult to know. He's a very very sphinx-like uh, character. Um, we do know one thing: uh, that um, he was extremely good at reading American public opinion. He uh, had a uh, very good uh, sense of where the country was and where it was drifting. And he knew what to risk and what was politically possible and what wasn't. So if we look at that, uh, I, would, I would say a couple of things. Uh, it was highly unusual for the Americans still to think of themselves as occupying a role of war as world leader. Um, what you you refer to the leadership role, which we've he heard a great deal about ever since 1945, but in the 20s and 30s, th uh, this was this was not a role that you would see touted uh, obsessively and constantly by American public figures or uh, in the uh, in the American American press. The country didn't have immense trading really. I mean, they, percentage of its gross national product relying on foreign trade was quite small. I think it was around 10%. Uh, the idea that it had military obligations and that it was itself militarily uh, implicated in happenings abroad was not widely shared. Um, in that sense, you'll, you'll sometimes read uh, that the American intervention, American entry into the First World War in 1917 was a great turning point in the country's history. <clears throat> it marked its <clears throat> uh, return to Europe after the warnings from its first president against entangling foreign relations and so on. I don't think that's true. I think the real change came in 1947 when the United States, when public opinion finally uh, accepted a permanent role the United States in uh, across the Atlantic, not to mention elsewhere. Uh, and uh, in the 20s and 30s, we're still there in that world which looked upon uh, the American involvement in the First World War as a huge mistake. I don't know how widely understood this is, but that, uh, that attitude was, was a majority attitude in the United States in the 20s and 30s. Uh, that the entry into the war had been a mistake, uh, that it had been fruitless, uh, that it was uh, undertaken for ungrateful allies, and so on. Uh, and nothing that happened in the 1930s was going to change that sentiment. Uh, so here again, I, I, I really, I, I look at the kind of public climate in which Roosevelt or anybody else was operating. I would start there. I don't know if that is what you're getting at. Yes, sense. no, I mean, exactly. So the, the sense of whether actually that, that idea of the American playing that role came under Truman rather than under, uh, in, in the wake of the Second World War, rather than pre-war. And that wasn't a sense of whether America was to take on uh, the mantle, if, if, particularly as you say, that the, um, the, the feelings of the, of the First World War were so raw uh, as a mistake. Yes, I think it came with the Cold War not even with the Second World War. In 1945, the overwhelming sentiment among the Americans was bring the boys home. They didn't want them there. It, it, it took a, a, a major shift in 1947 to, 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 to change that. So I, uh, indeed, I, but I, I think I interrupted you, I'm sorry. No, no, not at all, not at all. I mean, in terms of going back a little bit earlier, but before the 30s, um, and working up, as you say, you know, 
how quickly these things can unravel. And you point to the in, in, in the opening talk about the idea of the exchange rate uh, and the gold standard as being you know this this fairly you know technical issue becoming a major uh, a major a diplomatic issue. Um, and I wonder whether you could talk a bit more about in the 1920s uh, the idea of you know uh, the kind of America's involvement through capital in Germany and how Germany was using American investment as kind of a, a counterweight to reparations demands by um, you know the French. Um, and by the British showed that, you know, that uh, Germany's strategic use of America, obviously H Hitler uh, sees America as this great, as, as, the, as the major, the major uh, rival, the major power, the one that, that to beat, uh, and that if America isn't uh, you know, reined in, uh, then that spells disaster for Europe uh, as a whole, rather than simply just Germany. So what, what, how, how do we explain within Germany, looking a bit more at the German idea, as, as idea of attitudes towards America, what can America do as a benefit, and, and, and how that changes under uh, Nazi leadership? Um, well, uh, I, um, uh, American isolationism never extended to American banks. Um, in the 20s, uh, isolationism, which as you, you may know is a, is a term that's been contested, but I think if you look at it as a reluctance or refusal to become deeply involved in anything European in particular. It's really a kind of anti-Europeanism. Didn't mean staying out of Latin America or uh, well, even there it, it, uh, it had implications. Uh, it never meant, uh, it never meant uh, not uh, investing in Europe in the form of, for example, huge amounts of capital. And uh, once the, um, political situation stabilized with the Dawes Plan, the Dawes Agreement of 1924, and the German um, uh, inflation crisis ended, and reparations were sort of rescheduled and, uh, and uh, as people hoped, uh, uh, resolved. American banks, the investment banks, were happy to step in uh, and lend um, large amounts of money uh, or invest large amounts of money uh, in a uh, German recovery. Uh, that was something that the coalition governments of Weimar were, were quite happy to entertain. Some of this has been seen as the distant ancestor of what later became the Atlantic, or the Atlanticist German option. Uh, that is, a German recovery, German, German interests lay in identifying itself with the United States. Uh, and that option was uh, one that um, was uh, chosen in the 1920s in part to bring pressure to bear on the French. So there were good reasons for the, those Weimar governments of the mid 1920s to um, pursue the American option. Now you asked about what happened later. This is precisely the sort of thing that Hitler detested. Uh, to a Hitler and to those who thought the way he did, that you do not solve, you do not tie a country's destiny to anyone else. Uh, you don't allow it to depend on trade or commerce or even alliances, and certainly not on uh, international monstrosities like the League of Nations. Uh, so that I think that kind of thinking, which of course the Nazis associated with the betrayals of Weimar, uh, was fundamentally impossible for the Nazis to follow. Uh, and the uh, implications followed. Now, there were, there were other circumstances behind the, uh, the shift of the Third Reich, uh, and the uh, uh, American money dried up after 1929. There were other things going on, but I think that shift uh, uh, was there. Is, is that what you were, you were getting at? Yes, exactly, yes, trying to, you know, tra the tracing that, uh, that, that sea change uh, between the Weimar government and the Third Reich. Uh, mm. Actually, you shouldn't peg. Um, and I guess it, it's interesting because up until uh, the 19, I mean, you saw at the beginning of the Young Plan, uh, or towards the end of the Young Plan, it come under massive strain. But even up until that point, Atlanticism seemed to be working under Stresemann as, as for it seemed to work, it seemed to be benefiting Germany. Is that your take? Uh, that actually Atlanticism, or the end of Atlanticism, or the end of um, of, uh, of the Weimar government more broadly uh, was actually much, it, it's too clumsy to consider it as purely a product of the of the Great Depression um, that actually it was working and it, it recovered quite quickly or is, is that your take on that? 
You mean the, the recovery in the uh, mid to later 20s? Yes, exactly. Yes, indeed. I think it was part of it. I, uh, um, I, I know that uh, economic historians uh, argue about the extent to which the whole thing was a merry-go-round, as you, as you may know, that with the money provided by American banks, the Germans paid the reparations that they owed France, which then used that money to pay its war debts to Britain and the United States. And so we have a, a circular, uh, uh, a, a circle that couldn't go on forever. Uh, I, there is uh, uh, some truth in that, but there, there's, there, there's no denial that if you had to, ha if you had to identify a few happy years in the 20s and 30s, they would be those between about 1925 and 1928 or so, or 28, 29, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Germany. And I think the, the corollary to this is that um, when that whole system was seen to fail, uh, that provided more wind for the sails of the uh, of the far right, of the Nazi right uh, in the um, uh, in the early in the early thirties. Um, I um, uh, the years in which it did work were the years of uh, almost total obscurity for the Nazis in the in the mid um, uh, in the uh, in the mid nineteen twenties. Uh, there is another indication of that. I mean, one could one could go on at great length about this, but the, there was a referendum. On the, you mentioned the Young Plan, which um, uh, emerged um, in the later twenties uh, to um, re reschedule, re, to reschedule uh, reparations yet again. There was a referendum on it in in uh, in Germany. Which uh, the far right, the far right opposed any kind of any agreement of that sort, even though this agreement was greatly to Germany's benefit, because it, it amounted to an acknowledgement, uh, it amounted to an agreement with the West, which was in the former victors, which was in, it, in itself distasteful to them. But the voters who voted in favor of that, um, who voted against that referendum, there there is a continuity between those who voted for Hindenburg, these right wing nationalist voters, conservative nationalist voters who had voted for Hindenburg in 1925, would vote for uh, him again in the spring of 32, and then increasingly vote for the Nazis in the uh, elections, in the massive electoral breakthroughs uh, of, the, of the early 30s. There's a continuity between the voting base, uh, and um, which was opposed to those kinds of agreements from the first, in the first place. Uh, I mean, that's a, something that a, a electoral socio, uh, the uh, historians of, elect, of elections follow. Mm -hmm. No, that's, yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, just to, to broaden the scope a little bit about, you know, in that period, uh, post, as you said, you, the main focus of the book, post that <laughs> of 1933, which is kind of the, the racialization of international relations um, as well, and, and particularly under the Third Reich. But it, equally, as, as you rightly focus on in your book, is that it's a much more, it's a much, it's a more global phenomenon. It's the Japanese and their attitudes towards the Chinese over Manchuoko and, and, and their attitudes towards, you know, the ethnic inferiority of the Chinese that they're, that they're conquering, and this broader racialization in Germany over the international jury, uh, the jury and their uh, role in trade and commerce. Did uh, powers such as the U.S., Britain, obviously we, we, we're fully versed on you know the, the appeasement, and but did did, did you know um, diplomats, did uh, cabinet ministers and in the U.S. Uh, secret, did they fully grasp the extent of the racialization of international relations in the 1930s and what that would augur, uh, oh. or was it the case of hindsight conditioning us, or, or did they fully grasp at the time? what that implied, the racialization of international relations? Um, now that's a, um, th that's a very interesting question. Actually, I think somebody should work on that. Um, and there, here, here are some elements of, a, uh, of, a, um, of an answer, um, really very, very partial elements. Um, I don't think, uh, very few understood Hitler. R really, very few understood th the centrality of race to the Nazi project. Um, the um, uh, if if anyone understood the threat contained in Mein Kampf, it was the Russians. In it, Hitler 
announced Germany's need to expand into the Soviet Union. You can't get more clear, you can't get much clearer than that. Um, but even then, <clears throat> a few Russians did. Karl Radek, uh, Zinoviev, who had translated Mein Kampf in 1932. But I think it was just too difficult for uh, Stalin, among others, to realize the centrality of the racial project, which is a race war in the East, to the uh, German government. Now, it, a lot, a lot, there's a lot more that could be said about that, but I think that, that point is, is, is clear. Even less, uh, of course, did, uh, did the British understand it. The British ambassador in Berlin at the time of the uh, advent of, the, of the, uh, Hitler's accession to power, early in 33, Rumbold, like many others, thought that this was a resurrection of the traditional Wilhelmine Germany, Prussian nationalism, and that the Prussian conservatives might very well keep him, in, uh, keep him under control. And then he eventually, by April, brought himself to struggle through Mein Kampf, which I hadn't been translated into English, and uh, which is an exceptionally boring book. I don't know if uh, but he, he did read, um, read. And in a famous telegram or a famous uh, cable sent to a foreign office in late April, he um, said it was fantastical. It's very difficult to know whether to take these notions seriously, but he had seized the essential centrality of race to Hitler's thinking. And then he then backed off that and said, he sort of backed off as though unwilling to accept the full consequences of that. That's not unusual. And Rumbold was better than most, uh, even those who, he was a serious, uh, who tried to understand what was going on. So just taking the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the case of the Nazis, I, I think you have a good case there that few had understood if that's what's meant by the racialization of um, international relations, few had really understood it. Um, there is another angle to this though, and that is the racialization of their own, uh, of their own attitudes. And I'm not speaking here of um, say attitudes in the American State Department or the British Foreign Office to uh, subject peoples, colonial peoples. I'm speaking of attitudes towards Latins, towards Slavs, Eastern Europeans, um, some have looked at anti-Semitism. That, that's not new, uh, the anti-Semitism in the Foreign Office and the, the American State Department. But some of these attitudes towards other, um, towards say the Eastern European peoples may very well have encouraged um, the, the attitude that this is all right for Germany to expand there. This would be a very good solution to matters. Uh, after all, these people are incapable of governing themselves and so on. So there's another angle to this, and that's the survival, whether one can call them ethnic prejudices, I think that could still fall within the, within the umbrella of racialization of international relations. I imagine you would mm -hmm. do that. That would be another way of looking at this and another angle to explore. Um, there are many, now you mentioned the Japanese uh, and, the, um, and the Chinese, and um, there, I, uh, d d do you mean who, who under, th that, the, that the Japanese regarded the Chinese as inferior is, um, was, is, was clear to some, but it, others understood that it was more complicated than that. The Japanese were very much aware of being in the presence of a very ancient civilization. And this uh, somewhat complicated their attitude towards the, uh, the Chinese uh, under their control. That's a whole other question, but it, it really is in the, in the long history of um, Japanese-Chinese relations. The Jap well, the second Sino-Soviet War from 1931 to 1945 uh, is a, um, that's an important, uh, all I can say is it's an important theme. I don't know to what extent that in itself has been studied. Anyway, there, there are- uh, that, Yeah. yeah it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, as you point out in your book, there's that sea change in the Japanese cabinet um, from the kind of Occidental Western, uh, you know, pro League of Nations outlook. Um, and excuse me if I'm, if I'm sort of slightly oversimplifying it towards the, the very much more Japanese militaristic 
um, you know, shut in a similar vein to the uh, German approach, sort of shutting away from from cooperation on on the League of Nations, uh, and obviously in the case of extending the whole, it's the Jehol line or the Jehol line uh, as well. I mean, in terms of you know, we talk, uh, and we talk in your book. You talk a lot about you know making a mockery of these systems, i.e., the League of Nations, whether it be in the question of of um, of of Japan. Um, but actually, you know, do you think that in 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 the sense, and obviously taking into account the extent of not isolationism, but but you know, feelings in the U.S., was it ever possible uh, for intervention to prevent Japanese encroachment in China or in the case of in in Africa over questions of Abyssinia? You know, we talk about the passivity. Was it ever feasible, on the other hand, that they could have acted? Uh, and obviously, I know there's a slight counterfaction there, but but was that was it feasible, or was it the case much in the same way as today? You know, we can, we talk about the Uyghur Muslims um, as well, and you know the idea of, of big states protecting minorities. The U.S. could never feasibly intervene in China to protect the rights of U- Uyghurs. It's just not is is that a similar is it a case that even if they wanted to, they just couldn't? Uh, I. Um... Are you going to, of course, the same question has been asked about Nazi Germany. Yes. Could anything have been done there once Hitler came to power? And um, th- uh, that, again, is a big, is a big question. I, w- what were the options um, th- in the case of, the, of, um, of East Asia? W- once the Japanese um, invaded Manchuria in 1931, uh, had they stopped there, I think it would have been extremely difficult to dislodge them. But as the 30s wore on, uh, the Japanese uh, proceeded to get themselves bogged down into an ever more ambitious war in China itself, to the south. Well, Manchuria was part of China, I shouldn't say China itself, but so the, 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 the coastal areas of China. And that, of course, proved to be an absolute, that, that proved to be a disaster. And that ultimately was what brought the United States to become involved and uh, led to Pearl Harbor. So in the end, something was done. But I think your question is, couldn't something, could anything have been done a lot sooner? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, namely, I think you mean 1931 itself, uh, when the Japanese did first uh, invade Manchuria. Uh, it's, uh, the League of Nations did condemn Japan. Japan left the League of Nations. And that, of course, didn't do anything. The League of Nations was only as effective as its members. It's like the UN today. Uh, on its own, it, it's not some abstract thing hovering in limbo that can act as it wants to. If, uh, in this case, the only ones who could have brought it to act to impose meaningful sanctions were the British and the Americans and the to a lesser extent, the French. Um, now, if, if the question is, would economic sanctions, if necessary, backed by an Anglo-American naval threat, have worked? Uh, I don't know. Um, but could that have been tried anyway? And I suppose the argument of my book, once again, is that domestic public opinion in both countries would never have allowed it. Um, Not only is it very difficult to persuade a democracy to fight a preventive war, it was especially difficult then to um, uh, ask uh, the the domestic population to accept the risk of one. You mentioned Abyssinia. There too, there was considerable confusion. You had so-called pacifist sentiment and that's it's a sentiment that favored the League of Nations and the uh, refusal to allow aggression to take place. And when asked if they would support economic sanctions by the League of Nations, a great majority of the British answered yes. But did they understand uh, that behind economic sanctions lies the risk of war? If a naval action is called for to enforce the sanctions, or if the so-called mad dog act that, that, the, that the Navy feared by Mussolini might result in the sinking of a British ship, in which case a war might break out. Did they understand that? And in that case, would they have supported it? The, it's not altogether clear that everyone understood that. But when asked about the, the, the use of force, the numbers dropped quite steeply. So again, I, 
same question then about when, if ever, would it have been possible to stop Hitler? And, and that, I mean, we can talk about that f- for a very long time. Mm-hmm. But if, I think if there ever was a moment, it would be precisely at the time that, um, that we're talking about, just after Hitler had come to power, or in the first year or 18 months, when Germany would have been far too weak to resist. But the problem was that nobody really understood the German threat at that point, or not, not nobody, but um, most of the countries that really could act uh, didn't really understand it. It would have been very difficult to get the degree of popular support necessary for that undertaking, which could have led to, led to long-term complications. I mean, how, how many people would have, uh, would have uh, enjoyed a, uh, a permanent occupation of Germany then in the, midst of a, in the midst of an economic depression with massive unemployment at home and so on? So between the question of what would have worked and what was feasible, uh, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a chasm there. And that's about as confusing an answer as I could possibly give, but it's a, uh, I mean, it's a... No, you know, not at all. Thank you for going. I mean, it's, I guess also as well, I mean, we talk about the, the centrality of race to Hitler's view, but of course Hitler's view was never, I mean, there was a broader aim and there was a, there was a sense, but there was never, you know, dogmatic inflexible. I think I'm, I'm thinking of the Hossback Hosp, memorandum and the idea of the expectation of a Franco-Italian or in some of the kind of ideas that they didn't want war with Britain and France in 1939, or, or that sort of idea um, as well. And so Hitler's expectation, how that evolved. And interestingly, you know, the sense that, it, you know, within that Nazi war cabinet, there was not a, or within, you know, plannings for war, there was a lot of dissent, um, as you know, with the case of, um, at the, during the time of um, negotiations between Neville Chamberlain and Hitler, there was, the, there was a possibility of a plot against Hitler that could really have uh, actually worked. Yes. Um, do, do, do you think that actually, you know, where we talk about, do you think Hitler's view was dogmatic? Was it flexible? How do we, how should we make sense of things like the Hossback Memorandum uh, and how war eventually, you know, we talk about this grand plan, uh, but actually war evolved in a slightly different way uh, to, to what Hitler might have, you know, anticipated. Um, yes, yes. Um, I think a great deal of confusion arose around that, that, that controversy over whether, whether Hitler had a plan or not. Um, I, I, um, that was the, the post Nuremberg, uh, 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 notion, uh, that, uh, Hitler's, that, that, that the war of aggression was planned step by step and that it, that it, that it, that, uh, that it followed, if not a blueprint, uh, then precisely a, um, a, a, a set of phases uh, according to a plan. And the Hossback Memorandum was, was, which you mentioned quite correctly, it was brought up to, um, even though the Hossback Memorandum allowed for contingencies, but there is such a thing as contingency planning, if this, then that. Uh, and as you probably know, then A.J.P. Taylor wrote his very mischievous book, which um, the origins of the Second World War in the early 60s, which um, denied that there was any plan and deny that Hitler was doing anything different than what any other German statesman would have done uh, in the interwar years, which was uh, trying to undo Versailles and trying to seize advantages for his country as they arose and so on. Um, the, the problem is that um, a, 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 a plan is one thing, a, a goal is another. Uh, that, to my mind, Hitler's uh, goal to launch a race war in the East uh, that would enslave or exterminate millions of people there, colonize the lands, uh, provide the basis for a, what might later become a, 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 a war with the United States over the other world, world powers, but would in any case provide the basis for Germany's world power status. That goal was there and I don't think that goal ever changed. That goal has very definite racial notions. And it also had um, roots, in specifically Germanic roots of the recent past. And I'm thinking of the, uh, at the end of the First World War, when the German Empire occupied very large parts of Tsarist Russia. Uh, and uh, the uh, idea of a German Empire in the East was uh, not a far-fetched fantasy. <clears throat> um, everything Hitler said, you can find some sort of basis for it. 
That doesn't mean that he had a step-by-step -step plan to do this. Uh, and it doesn't mean either that everybody was aware of that distant goal. In fact, they went to considerable lengths to hide it <clears throat> in the uh, 30s. They didn't want to scare people, uh, either their own, their own, their own public or, uh, or the uh, foreign powers. Uh, now, is that the kind of question you're getting at? Yes, exactly. you, yes. I mean, there, there is a, a plan is not a blueprint. A goal is not a blueprint. A, uh, uh, that Hitler could be very pragmatic, or I sh should I say could improvise, <clears throat> seize opportunities as they arose, uh, is undeniable in the 30s. Uh, that he, um, he was quite skillful at realizing the weaknesses of the French, for example, or indeed of trying to, uh, this is very surprising for someone who knew so little about the rest of the world, uh, but he could seize a, uh, a diplomatic opportunity when it arose, uh, and um, whether he had planned for it or not, it does not mean uh, that he was making up his uh, his impetus as as he went along. And if I may, um, if I may return to what I might sound like a broken record, but back to the um, continuum between domestic and foreign policy, um, I don't. Uh, I think that the uh, foreign diplomats understood this, but I think that in my book, I don't remember actually, but I think that in my book, I, I do describe a moment about a week or so after he became chancellor. So the, this would have been in February, 1933, when the annual dinner hosted by the German foreign ministry uh, for uh, the foreign diplomatic corps uh, was given as it had been before and Hitler was present. And I happened to find in the, um, uh, private papers of the French foreign minister, the French ambassador, <clears throat> André François Pensé, his <clears throat> the barely legible, the handwritten notes of his, that evening, um, in which he managed to talk to Hitler. Uh, after dinner, he managed to get Hitler aside and talk to him for a bit. The French ambassador was a Germanist. And Hitler really talked about, first of all, Hitler seemed very ill at ease, surrounded by uh, all the finery of diplomatic regalia he was a socially very self-conscious, uh, 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 ill at ease, and <clears throat> didn't have much to say. Uh, but he talked in pleasantries, saying that for now he was too busy with the German domestic scene uh, to uh, worry too much about foreign affairs. But only at one point did he become animated. And that's when he spoke of the November criminals, right? the criminals inside Germany, whom he held responsible for the country's defeat in the First World War. That is to say, Jews, communists, socialists, pacifists, etc. All of them uh, internationalists, communists, Bolshevism. Uh, and only then uh, did his eyes burn with a really fanatical hatred. Uh, and only then did the French ambassador develop the sense that he was really seeing the real man. Uh, and in uh, Hitler's foreign policy projects, they are directly linked to that way of thinking. Um, the uh, survival of Germany and the destruction of its enemies uh, at home and abroad because those enemies were linked. Uh, the failure of, for, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of leaders making and conducting foreign policy to try to understand something like that uh, was very consequential. Um, I think they were still stuck in the world of Bismarck and Castle Ray and Richelieu and uh, the treaties and uh, accommodations and compensations and so on. Never understood that Hitler was never about the Treaty of Versailles. And that didn't matter to him. Uh, that was something else. But I'm, I'm, uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm rambling here. No, not at all. No, and it's, it's fantastic to be able to talk about this. And um, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm conscious. I don't want to keep holding you too long, as, as, as fun as it's been in covering this material. I, I bring, in sort of bringing it to a close, um, a final question, a little bit about, um, you know, we talk about German, and obviously, you know, it's impossible to look that much further than Germany in establishing the cause of the Second World War. But obviously, there is a case to be made uh, for the state of Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, the, the collapse of the post-imperial order, uh, Habsburg and Ottoman. And obviously, as we know, in 1938, of course, Hungary also invaded uh, Czechoslovakia, um, you know, after the Germans invaded that rump bit of Czech um, Hungary invaded it, essentially declaring it an invalid state. It didn't exist as a state as well. How much did the uh, nature or the post-imperial order in, in Central Europe uh, contribute, uh, independent of German, of the German, you know, racial and, and ideological war? How much did, did the status of Central Europe contribute uh, to the deterioration in, in, in stability in the 1930s? Uh, um, well, <clears throat> 
<clears throat> the, uh, that too is a, uh, uh, in one way or another, a great deal. This again is something that I don't think Western, not very many, not a great many uh, analysts and government figures in the West fail to understand. I'm speaking here of Britain and the United States in particular, uh, but not only. Uh, after all, uh, hadn't the First World War broken out there? Um, the idea that another war might break out there didn't really seem to trouble as many as it should have. Um, the um, central reason for this was, as you probably know, the um, existence of a mosaic of minorities uh, within each of these post-1918 countries. Um, and these minorities were often seen as harboring loyalties across the border. Um, w whatever it is, uh, Hungarian minorities in Romania, or Bulgarian minorities in Romania, or Sudeten German, minor G German minorities in Poland and Czechoslovakia, or Ukrainian minorities in Poland, uh, and so on, all over Eastern Europe. Um, those minorities personified in the eyes of uh, some of the uh, domestic populations, uh, the foreign enemy in their midst, ripe ground for their own authoritarian leaders to, um, to exploit, fertile ground for exploitation rather, uh, and uh, also very, very tempting for powerful neighbors such as the Germans or the Russians, once the, or the Italians, once they were able to do so. So, in that sense, the uh, I, I think the um, the, uh, the minority question, once uh, neighbors were found willing to exploit it, uh, was crucial. Yes, I, uh, absolutely, absolutely crucial. Uh, and. Um, I, um, it's that, that fatal triangle of uh, domestic politics, domestic minorities, powerful neighbor um, that uh, eventually exploded uh, in, uh, and that was common not only to a revisionist state such as Hungary, which you've mentioned, Hungary wanted very much to undo the Treaty of Versailles because it, it had lost so much territory. Uh, as it was to the status quo states, such as Poland, which owed its resurrection uh, to the Treaty of Versailles and very greatly feared uh, the, uh, the undoing of it. Uh, the, uh, so the internal minority question was, was central once it was exploited by those prepared to do so. That I think is, uh, is not a very controversial statement to make. Brilliant. Well, thank, thank you very, very much, um, Professor Paul Jankowski, for, for you know, staying with us for such a long. And I think I speak for all of us in saying that was an incredibly engaging uh, discussion, incredibly engaging talk. Um, you know, I'm, you know, the opportunity to discuss, particularly as unfortunately with bookshops closed in London, we can't. Uh, I mean, we have Amazon, but um, obviously the, the whole sort of idea of supporting independent bookshops. But obviously, if as part of this discussion, I, I have it on my side. If you can access, uh, you can order this on Amazon. This is all against all, which is the book we is the uh, that has just come out earlier, actually before, was written before the coronavirus pandemic. So I was wondering actually when you said that uh, in your preface that people had, uh, preface and people had asked you what you're working on and said, oh, it's so similar to today. This was before the coronavirus pandemic with that kind of economic uh, dimension. So I wonder whether you think that uh, those parallels are perhaps a bit more pronounced and you say actually the 1900s are the more accurate. Do you, is that something you've changed now with the coronavirus pandemic? And uh, uh, Not really, no. I um uh, I think, uh, well, when the, when the pandemic uh, struck, it seemed to me that it was accentuating these uh, beggar thy neighbor uh, policies all over the place, with the borders being closed. And some of the, EU, in, in the, I think it may have been the, I don't remember if it was the Italian prime minister or who said that this may be the end of the EU. Uh, they were so frightened at the, the, the closing of borders and so on. And so that didn't, um, that didn't lead me to, uh, uh, at the time to, uh, but I hope I, I hope I was wrong about that. And, and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I am. So it may, uh, um, it may, uh, 
I actually didn't want to uh, link the book too much to the present. Uh, publishers often try to get you to do that because it sells the book. Exactly, yes. The, the problem is uh, it, 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 you, you end up being wrong within six months if you start trying to talk about the, uh, the present. So I, I tried to, um, as I said today, to draw a, a certain parallel in this uh, uh, tension between transnational causes and national fragmentation or transnational causes and transnational fragmentation. But that's about as far as I wanted to go in drawing parallels. I'm still not entirely convinced by many of the others. About no, and of course, as you know, these are you know they're the product of their time. You know, as that sounds very cliche, but it is. You know, these are these are uh, specific to the 1930s, and obviously, you know, we can talk about various panels with international relations. But actually, at the time, no, I mean, very, I mean, fantastic to have the opportunity to speak with you. And I'm so glad we could do this. Um, and uh, I speak for all in saying, you know, as I said before, an incredibly engaging discussion. Hopefully, in the not too distant future, we'll be able to host you in person in Cambridge, uh, from Cambridge, US to Cambridge, UK. It would, be, it would be a great pleasure, and uh, thank you, thank you very much again for uh, for inviting me and for uh, having read my book. Uh, your, uh, I don't know whether um, I don't know what percentage of the total readership this far you represent, but it may it may be quite a large one. Well, I know, I know, but like, hopefully this uh, um, hopefully this call will have encouraged people to actually go out and, and read because I think um, you know, I, wouldn't stand in, I won't stand in their way. No, brilliant. Well, thanks very much, um, Paul. And Thank obviously you very much, and thanks Thank to everyone you. else there. Brilliant. Okay, speak soon, Paul. Yes, right. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.